Welcome everybody to this seventh students webinar with them, FSOM students ultrasound webinar. Our topic for today are the abdominal vessels. My name is Dieter Nürnberg from Germany and it's a pleasure for me to present that webinar together with Alina Popescu from Timisoara. I like to show you our program. One moment. This is our program for today, ultrasound of abdominal vessels. Our structure is a first lecture about examination anatomy pathology. And this lecture is given by Leandro Fernandez from Venezuela. He is one of the representatives of the WIFM and he is very experienced in vessel examination. The second part is a short journal club. And the third that is given by me again, that is about uh, pathology of abdominal vessels. Today, we want to speak more about portal system. We end with the interactive session prepared by Niels Daum and David Bowden, and we show you video clips, and then you have to give us answer to our questions. What do you see there at that clips? And that is for us also uh, to test what you learned in the lectures. I'd like to stop this program. We like to start now with the first lecture and Leandro, that's really a pleasure for me to introduce you. And let's start with the lecture, ultrasound of the abdominal vessels, basics, anatomy, pathology. Please. Hello, everybody. I am Leandro Fernandez from Caracas, Venezuela, and as co-chairman of the Education Committee of the World Federation for Ultrasound in Medicine and Biology, I welcome you all to this scientific session. In the next 30 minutes, I will discuss on the topic ultrasound of abdominal vessels, aorta, and cava vein. This is the lecture outline. Uh, we will see some uh, uh, information related to the uh, probe movement. Then we will see the transducer positions on the abdomen. We will see the scan technique. Then I will show you some normal uh, images of the aorta and the cava vein. Then we will go to the pathological findings, abdominal aorta aneurysm and uh, inferior cava vein thrombosis. And finally, we will present some uh, uh, conclusions. Let's see the different, uh, the different um, kind of movements that we, we, we always do when performing an ultrasound exam. So we can move the transducer on the X-plane. We can rock the transducer, maintain the X-plane. Then we go to the Y plane by rotating the transducer. And again, we can do this kind of movement, displacement and rocking movement. And we can have also the images obtained in the Z plane, is a coronal plane. So we have the sliding here. We are making, uh, we, we are moving the transducer along, along the structure that we are studying, our hypothetical vessel here. We can slide in two planes in two directions, north to south, east to west. Then we can do the compression. With the compression, we get the image, the image closer in our screen. It's very useful to do compression, for example, in studying the, the peripheral veins. And now we have the rocking. Rocking movement is quite useful when we have limited acoustic window. So we have the rotation and we can have transversal and longitudinal view of the structure. And finally, the tilting. 
Tilting again is very useful when we have limited access, when limited acoustic window. And in each position, we can perform all this movement, movement that we have seen now. Let's see where to place the transducer in order to make the assessment of the aorta and the inferior cava vein. I recommend to start uh, in the epigastrial area with the transducer in transversal position. We can remember that we can uh, always uh, uh, see and look for the mark. This mark, the north of the transducer, uh, can be oriented to the right in transversal positions, or can be or must be oriented to the head in longitudinal uh, in longitudinal uh, position. This is an inter international agreement in, in how to place and how to rotate the transducer. So we start in epigastrium, and then we move slowly from epigastrium until the umbilical uh, scar. We can move the transducer a little bit to the right if we can focus on the inferior cava vein, or a little bit to the left if we want to focus on the aorta. So then we move the transducer, make the rotation from transversal to longitudinal, and again, from the epigastrium to the umbilical uh, scar. If we, go, if we need to uh, assess the inferior cava vein, sometimes we have to move the transducer to the left. You can see here. And frequently, we can use this acoustic window and we use the liver as, a, uh, as an acoustic element in order to see the path of the inferior cava vein, especially. This is the necessary equipment to perform these ultrasound assessment. Uh, we can use different types of ultrasound machines. We can see we we can use rob, robust uh, 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 equipment, uh, car-based equipment, or we can use portable systems, or even ultra ultra portable system like this one here. This machine here has two two transducers in one uh, in, in one side it's a linear transducer and in the other side is a convex transducer and the communication can be done with wire or wireless by using wi-fi communication between the machine and uh, the smartphone or our tablet those are the types of machines and then we have the the type and we have different types of uh, transducers or probes. Uh, the most frequently used is the convex with a frequency of five to one or five to two megahertz, e even six to one, depending on the technology that you are using in the moment. This is the one uh, to use uh, or to perform abdominal studies. But we can also use the phased array transducer uh, with a frequency four to two, four to one, five to one megahertz. And this phased array transducer is the one that we normally use to perform uh, cardiac echocardiogram studies. So we can use any of them. Any of them uh, allows us to uh, allows us to uh, to obtain a very, very accurate kind of image. The preparation for the abdominal aorta study, the ideal is a four to six hours or even eight, but not more than eight hours of fasting in order to reduce intestinal gas interference. Over eight hours, 12 hours, it, it's, uh, it's too much because the, the bowel will produce more gas. So the recommendation, ideal, six hours of fasting. Uh, and we need the patient collaboration to stop breathing shortly, just to obtain, just to freeze the image and capture the image in order to make the, measure, the measurements. So let's uh, make some uh, comments regarding the scan technique. So I mentioned before uh, to start in transversal, in the epigastrium area, and then we move slowly the transducer to the umbilical scar. 
when we do that, we obtain this kind of image. Here we can see a very well-defined circle. This is the aorta. And in real time, you see the pulsatility of the aorta. Beside the aorta, we, you, you will find the inferior cava vein. But depending on the level of your transducers, the distance of the, between the aorta and the cava vein uh, it's, uh, can, uh, can, can be different, closer or, or, or distant from each other. Please notice this image here. This is the vertebral body. This is the anterior, anterior wall. So this is the acoustic shadow produced by, uh, by the vertebra. Don't make confusion, please, uh, between this image and, uh, and a triple A uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. This is the aorta, okay, in real time with pulsatility. So we have the image in transversal and we can make start to make measurements. The correct measurement is from adventitia to adventitia, external wall to uh, external wall. Can be, normally we do it in transversal, but it can be done also in longitudinal, but external to external and quite important here. The number, the measurement is must be, should be less than three centimeters. Less than three centimeters is the normal. In fact, the aorta, it has different diameters depending on the level of the measurement. So at the level of the diaphragm, uh, we can have up 2.7 millimeters, but uh, at the level of the bifurcation, the number is 2.1 millimeters. And there is a difference of five millimeters between male and female patients. Male has bigger aortas, uh, but always, always less than three centimeters. Here we can see in this video clip how easy and how fast is the obtention of the image. So we place the transducer in the epigastric area, move the transducer to the umbil umbilical scar, and we can see if the aorta is normal or we have a aneurysm here, abdominal aortic aneurysm. We can stop it, we can freeze it, or we can just place it without movement our transducer and we can study plagues, we can see parietal thrombus, we can see uh, the lumen, residual lumen. So we can obtain a lot of information just with the, uh, obtaining and capturing the image in just a few seconds. Another important information regarding the measurements, we have to place our probe and uh, we have to orient our beam, ultrasound beam, uh, very, very perpendicular with the structure, with the aorta, in order to obtain uh, more accurate uh, numbers, more accurate measurements. Uh, it's not correct to make this angulation here, this inclination here, uh, the correct position and uh, insonation is a uh, very perpendicular in order to obtain, I repeat, an accurate measurement. An overview of a uh, very brief overview of the abdominal aortic aneurysm, AAA. It affects 1.5 to 2% of the general adult population. Uh, six to 7% of patients over 60 years 75% of cases are related to atherosclerosis and up to 91% of the AAAs are infrarenal. 55% of AAAs are asymptomatic and casually found on an imaging test. Pre-hospital mortality is 60% and hospital mortality 50% of those who arrive to urgent surgery with a total mortality of uh, 
85%. So it's necessary to do a very early diagnosis. This is mandatory. There are different types of AAA, the fusiform focal, the fusiform diffuse, the eccentric and the saccular. The most uh, frequently seen AAAs are those, the number one, number two, and number three. Saccular, you can see it, but with less frequency. Let's see this case. It's a 79 year old male patient, former smoker, former smoker. And here we have in transversal, the measurements 3.09 and 3.59 in transversal. We have the criteria equal or more than three centimeters. We have the diagnostic ready here, but we have, we have uh, another tool, another criteria. Uh, if we can do the measurement in the previous segment, you make the measurement uh, and uh, then you make another measurement we, in the lesion properly. Uh, if the increase of the previous segment, if, if uh, more than 50%, this is another criteria that you can use to make the AAA diagnosis. It's important also to, to, to uh, document the extension, how long, the, 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 the AAA is. So in this case, it's more than 10 centimeters. This is information very important for the surgeon, not only the AP and the transverse, but only also the uh, longitudinal uh, uh, measurement. This is a 67 year old male patient smoker, smoker for the moment of the test. And here we have the lesion very clear. Uh, with more than 10 centimeters, 10.2 centimeters long. And here, AP and transverse, 5.69 over three centimeters, 5.69 and 5.66 in transverse. We have ready, We've have, we did immediately the diagnostic AAA equal or more than three centimeters. I recommend to, to, to trace uh, a line. Uh, you can do it over the image or you can do it in your mind. Make a trace with the, we, we, with the long axis in this case. And then we have the line of representing the beam of ultrasound. And here is the place to make the measurement is a perfect cross with 90 degrees. So it's a perpendicular position of the beam and also of the calipers. This is a male, former smoker. Here we can see in B mode, 6.00 and 6.45 with power Doppler. And here with bidirectional power Doppler. I want to remind you the surgery criteria for male patients equal or more than 5.5 and for female patients equal or more than 5.0. But in this case, particular case, our patient had 91 years old at the moment of the test. Uh, so family, patient and uh, surgeon, uh, they all decided not to take the patient to surgery. If we have an aneurysm, if we have an evaluation, a previous evaluation, so we have to make sometimes re-evaluations. And uh, this is the interval recommended, recommended for the size of the, uh, the abnormality of the aorta. Here, 2.5 to 2.9. So the recommendation is to perform another test between three to five years. Three to four centimeters yearly. Every year we can do it, we need to do it, not more than two years. Four to 4.5 every six months, never more than one year of interval. 4.5 to 5.0 every three to six months, never more than six months. And 
5.0 to 5.5 every three months because we need to see the rate of enlargement, the rate of the increase of the diameter in order to uh, decide the proper moment for the intervention. That's the reason because we need to do the evaluation if every three months in these cases. I just want to show you a couple of advanced, uh, advanced uh, images. Uh, here we have the um, three-dimensional reconstruction with, with uh, an NGO CT, but it, in ultrasound, we can also perform 3D ultrasound by using uh, electromechanical transducer. This is the same transducer to perform 3D and 4D fetal uh, sonography. And here, this is the image obtained of the uh, aorta, the abdominal aorta, with three-dimensional ultrasound. We have here the uh, coronal. We have here, uh, excuse me, the transversal, the, uh, the longitudinal, and here a virtual coronal image. And then we can rotate the image. We can see the walls, the not only the external, but all, but the internal walls, the plates, or the eventual thrombus that we can find in this patient, parietal thrombus. Well, let's move to the inferior cava vein thrombosis. Although the condition, the condition is considered rare, case reports have shown that IVC thrombosis uh, may be underdiagnosed. IVC thrombosis should be part of the differential diagnosis for a patient with risk for a thromboembolic event. We have different causes for, for having an IVC thrombosis. Congenital abnormalities of the vessel, hypercoagulability states are another condition present, uh, compression for adjacent structures. And we can have inv invasion of renal cell tumors or pancreatic carcinoma. Also, but Chiari, but Chiari syndrome, liver abscess, retroperitoneal masses, and AAA and others. In our center, in our lab in, in, in Venezuela, the renal cell tumor and the pancreatic carcinoma, even ovarian carcinomas, ovaric carcinomas, are frequently cause of the IVC thrombosis. The normal IVC is seen like here. Here we can see the aorta and depending on the level, we have the IVC. Here by using the liver has an acoustic window. And in transverse and here in longitudinal. In longitudinal, in real time, we, we can observe the compression or, or, or extension, increase of the size and shortening of the size uh, according with the breathing movement, inspiration, or expiration. It's necessary to make measurements uh, of the normal cava vein. The recommendation is to perform the measurement uh, two centimeters distal for the diaphragm. And the measurement here must be under two centimeters, under two centimeters. This is important, for example, in order to study uh, the hemodynamic state. Uh, by studying the IVC, we are studying the heart. We are studying the right heart. Let's see this video here where we can observe an enormous right atum. And here the IVC is VCI in Spanish, vena cava inferior. And here we can see that we don't have, uh, uh, or we have a minimal collapse uh, the distance between expiration and inspiration is very slow, is very short. Normally we do it in B mode, many people do it in B mode, but also some authors use the M mode in order to uh, make the difference and calculate the, percent the percentage of collapse. So we have this scale here <clears throat> that allows us to estimate the CVP, the central venous pressure. IVC diameter less than two centimeters and a 
percentage of, of collapse on inspiration is over than uh, or more than 50%, it means that the CVP must be between zero to five millimeters of mercury. And here, the other side, the other extreme, uh, more than two centimeters with a minimal collapse, we can suppose that the uh, CVP is between 15 to 20. And if we have two centimeters, more than two centimeters with no collapse in on inspiration, so it means that, that the CVP is over 20 millimeters Hg. And now we have here an image inside the IVC. This is low and medium or low or and medium echogenicity uh, echoes uh, inside the vessel. So this is the characteristic of the image of the IVC thrombosis. Uh, this is an older machine, but if you are using a newer machine, so you can obtain softer, smoother uh, kind of image. The dynamic range, uh, it's better in these cases. And we can see, as I mentioned, uh, smooth images or smoother images. Clot, thrombus inside the vessel, partially. It's a partial clot because we still have uh, some areas without thrombus. In these cases, it's quite useful to use the color doppler. Here, power doppler. This is the thromb. This is the thrombus, and here the power doppler showing us uh, the the normal flow. The, the, uh, the pattern flow of, of the vessel because it's not occupied in all its extension. And this case here, this case here uh, was published in this article of the Journal of Emergency Medicine in October uh, 2016. This is a pediatric patient with a pulmonary embolism. Uh, and uh, they studied a kid. Uh, with no, uh, they found no lower extremities uh, thrombo thrombosis, but th they found uh, this clot here, this partial clot of the IVC, and uh, it was the cause of the pulmonary embolism. In our center, uh, the most common condition is the tumor thrombus. Here we have a, a, a dilated uh, cava vein with echoes with uh, low echogenicity to medium echogenicity inside uh, the, the vessel. And uh, in these cases of tumor thrombus, it's useful to use the color doppler. So we have here a tumor thrombus and adjusting the PRF in a low level we can see vascularization inside the thrombus is a, is, a, is a malignant thrombus, is an invasive thrombus. So please use color doppler uh, all the time. So uh, ultrasound is the modality of choice for initial evaluation of disorders of the abdominal aorta and the I, I inferior cava vein. Uh, AAA and IVC thrombosis are easily depicted. Students and physicians can offer an immediate diagnosis. Ultrasound of the abdominal aorta provides important anatomic and hemodynamic information. And uh, imaging of the proximal abdominal aorta is an integral part of the comprehensive transthoracic echocardiography. And 2D color doppler, uh, PW, CW doppler, 3D, and contrast atos, and contrast imaging are ultrasound tools to assess the abdominal aorta. Thank you so much for your kind attention. In the beginning. Okay, yes, we like it. And 
please. Are there some questions? We have already several questions in the Yes, chat. and give us a question. So yeah. the first one, it will be in which segment of the abdominal aorta is more prone to uh, have aneurysm? And normally is under the emergency of the renal arteries. So uh, they're, they're, that's the reason because they are called infrarenal. And 91 up to 91% are under the renal uh, emergency. The next one is, uh, is aorta measured transverse or anterior posteriorly? The best, uh, the most recommended is anterior posterior. Uh, always you have to, uh, to, to, to have less than three centimeters. But after you do the diagnosis in the anterior posterior, it's important to make also the transversal measurement. But normally we refer to uh, the first measure, uh, AP, AP measurement, anterior Is posterior. it also another question, an additional question, is it important to say what is the often lumen and uh, the free lumen and what is the thrombotic part? How large is the... Okay, we, we, we have to provide to the surgeon, especially to the surgeon, the three measurements, AP, transversal, and the longitudinal. And then you describe what kind of plagues we have inside. And if we have thrombos, uh, parietal thrombos, uh, uh, and eccentric or where are localized, we offer this information in our reports. In the past, I used to make the measurement of the residual lumen, but really is not that important because remember that probably the, the lumen is going to be the same. We have enlargement of the vessel uh, and sometimes it looks like uh, we have a very small lumen, but no, but not. The lumen is okay. The vessel is increased and it has thrombus. So it's not necessary to uh, report the uh, reduction of the lumen. Uh I shall come back to the next question because it's more of a difficult. Uh, the one, next one uh, starts with thank you for your presentation. The question is, is it safe uh, to check the compressibility of the vein when we suspect an IVC thrombosis? Is there a risk of embolization if the IVC has thrombosis and you compress it? Normally we can, if we have any doubt, we can compress, but a little bit. Because yes, it could be a cause of uh, of uh, thromboembolism. So if you see the image inside the IVC, uh, it the the normal image is anechoic. So if you are seeing uh, some some images inside, please please first you see in transversal or longitudinal. It doesn't matter. You decide, but make the two uh, approaches, longitudinal and then uh, the, the transversal. Then uh, use the color Doppler. You will see the thrombus and you will see some, some flow if, no, if the thrombosis is not a, a complete thrombosis. If you still have a, a doubt, okay, compress, but a little bit. Normally, I don't do compression. The next one is also... We, can, we should discuss about that, sorry, Alina, yes. because you know if we make an examination and we look of the iliacal vessels and we look for a femoral thrombosis or iliacal thrombosis, we use the compression. We have to use it. That is named the, the uh, vein compression sonography. That is a method and very easy because we don't need a color Doppler then, and we compress sometimes, and there are no uh, artificial uh, embolisms, I think. Yeah, even, even in, in lower extremity uh, um, it, thrombosis is, uh, is written, is described uh, okay. a couple of cases of pulmonary embolism in ver, ver, yeah. very in the past, in the past. Uh, compression is quite necessary and under the POCUS protocol, it's very easy to do it. Just compress gently if you are seeing some echogenicity inside, inside the vessels. But this is 
more important in lower in lower extremities. Okay. Okay. okay? But in cava vein is very rare, and, and okay. we have a we have a more volume. We have the abdomen Thank of you. the patient. Uh, the next, the Alina. Yes, the other question was: Please tell where to measure the IBC. Please tell again. <laughs> okay. Where to measure it? Okay. Uh, the IBC has uh, has two two regions, depending precisely pretending of the level in the epigastric in the under the epigastric in, so you you can you you have to to evaluate all the segments and very interested depending of the level of the of the assessment the cava vein you will find it for example uh, surrounded by liver then if you go down if you go down uh, the cava vein uh, get closer to to the uh, to the uh, abdominal aorta and then after that uh, we have we have again a modification of the of the shape of the cava vein at and at the end very lower in the very very lower position you will see uh, the level where the iliac iliac veins uh, enter to the cava vein four levels you have to check the four levels Okay, another question was uh, the pulsatility of aortic aneurysma. Is it the same like the normal aneurysma or is it disturbed? The pulsatility, okay. Uh, the vessel has pulsatility and normally the movement of the aneurysmans, it's, it's uh, accompanying the, the, the pulsatility of the... Of the uh, of the of the vessel what is different is the stiffness of the structure uh, of the walls because we have the plates and we have more pressure normally we don't do that but uh, it can it can be used some 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 people relate elastography of the walls and elastography of the plates of the of the of the triple a but we don't we don't do in a regular practice. We normally perform in B mode, then support with, uh, with the, the, the color doppler, and, and that's it, changes, changes the positions. Doppler, power doppler is not used of, uh, in, a, in a regular basis either. Another question was if the IVC is measured best in B mode or in M mode. Uh, it's the same thing, as you prefer. Uh, some authors uh, think that could be M mode could be more exact uh, because, uh, well, they have control in all the movement, inspiratory and expiratory, and you can see uh, in M mode uh, some, some, some kind of waves, sign of sinusoidal, I don't know how to say exactly that in English. Uh, and you can see here, and you have like a, an echocardiography uh, of the ventricle, uh, you can see the two positions. If you prefer to use it in B mode, right. If you prefer to use it in M mode, it's right too. In, in B mode, it's right, and M mode is right. Okay, the last question, Alina, that was, we say, uh, can we differentiate between a benign and a malignant thrombosis? And how we can differentiate? Okay, the first, and the, the first finding that malignant uh, thrombosis, tumor thrombosis, you can demonstrate uh, flow inside, vascularization inside. You have to decrease the PRF and you will see tiny vessels sometimes in different directions. Sometimes you have in the same plane, red and, and blue codification. Uh, so I think that this is the, the, the main difference. Uh, another kind of thrombus are more homogeneous, not, not malignant, are more homogeneous. You don't demonstrate flow. Uh, and back to the, to the, to the malignant, uh, you have the, the, the background, you have a preview diagnosis, or you are studying, for example, an abdominal uh, or performing a kidney, and you see the tumor in the kidney, and then you have to see the invasion of the renal vein, and you can see how the thrombus is going 
uh, accompanying the path, and you see then the thrombus inside the cava vein. So you have the, 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 the information, the uh, previous information of pancreas, if you were better, if you can see it uh, with the renal uh, or, or pelvic ovarian. Uh, you, can, you, you can even see the ovarian vein uh, if the ovarian vein is compromised. I think it's a comment. It's possible to show that with color Doppler with more, really more, uh, sensitive is contrast media ultrasound and in Europe we have contrast media ultrasound and a little bit later I can show you well the other one a situation of not of a cover thrombosis but similar of an portal vein thrombosis and then you can differentiate if you have vascularization in the thrombus then it's a tumor thrombus. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can also, continue our program. Uh, yes. One, just one second. I just wanted to tell you that also Alex is going to address a little bit uh, uh, this topic, actually the portal vein thrombosis. There was another question, uh, the one that I said that uh, keep it to the end because it's a little bit more difficult. It was regarding the PRF setting uh, that is recommended to use for Doppler. Okay. Uh, normally, if we are uh, assessing the aorta, uh, we can set the PRF in, in, in 2000 uh, or 2500 hertz. Uh, if we are uh, studying the, the cava vein, we have to decrease a little bit. Um, we can use uh, the same settings to, for, for the assessment of the, of, the porta, of the porta vein. It means around uh, 1,600 uh, hertz or, or 100, uh, 108, 1,800 hertz uh, is unusual, unusual, but we can reach even 1,200 hertz. Uh, if we want to study the vascularization of the tumor thrombus, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, if we can use 1,000 hertz. Thank you. These were all the Everybody. questions. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy. A lot of questions. Thank you. We will, I want to continue now. And it's yes. uh, a young man from Timisoara that is Alexandru Popa. Please start your presentation, Alexandru. Hello. Everyone, my name is Alexandru Popa. Uh, can you see my uh, my slide? Perfect. Okay, I'm a PhD student in the Department of uh, Gastroenterology of the University of uh, Medicine from Timisoara. And uh, today, as a follow-up of uh, the the question uh, from uh, before about the differentiation between malignant and uh, benign thrombosis. I will talk about portal vein thrombosis and the role of contrast-enhanced ultrasonography in uh, the characterization of it. So, as we all know, the portal vein is the main vessel of the portal venous system. And it's resulting from the confluence of splenic and superior mesenteric veins. Practically, the portal vein drains the blood from the gastrointestinal tract, gallbladder, pancreas, and spleen to the liver. Portal vein uh, thrombosis is defined as the formation of a thrombus within the portal vein and the intrahepatic portal branches. And it is the second most common cause of portal hypertension and one of the most common complications of liver cirrhosis. Similar to venous thrombosis occurring in other location of the body, uh, such as in uh, lower extremities, for example, the triad, triad composed by hypercoagulability, endothelial injury and stasis leads to the development of portal uh, vein thrombosis. Also, local factors often contribute to the development of portal vein thrombosis, and this include cirrhosis, abdominal malignancy, such as, for example, hepatocellular uh, carcinoma, abdominal infection, abdominal inflammatory condition, such as uh, inflammatory bowel disease, or uh, portal vein injuries, uh, such as, for example, uh, uh, trauma. 
also inherited and acquired thrombophilia can, uh, can be also involved. In general population, the prevalence uh, of uh, portal vein thrombosis was uh, reported around 1% in a study uh, based on an autopsy series from Sweden that included more than 23,000 uh, patients. Uh, in cirrhotic patients, uh, the prevalence depends on the severity of the cirrhosis. Therefore, the prevalence ranges between 1% in patients with uh, compensated cirrhosis to 25% in uh, candidates with liver transplantation, so in decompensated cirrhosis. <clears throat> On the other hand, portal vein thrombosis is uh, more frequent in uh, patients with uh, cirrhosis and hepatocellular uh, carcinoma, occurring in approxim uh, approximately 35% of cases. The latest uh, Baveno consensus recommended a standardized classification of portal vein thrombosis by taking in consideration the time course, the percent of the occlusion, and the interval change. So uh, if you look, look at the time course, uh, we define a recent uh, portal vein thrombosis as a portal vein thrombosis that uh, it's presumed to be present for less than uh, six months. And the chronic one, if it's present or persistent uh, above uh, six months. Uh, taking consideration the, the, the percent of um, occlusion of uh, main portal vein, um, the portal vein thrombosis can be completely occlusive uh, when we don't have any lumen uh, left, partially occlusive when the clot is obstructing more than 50% of the original vessel lumen, or uh, minimally occlusive when the clot is uh, obstructing uh, less than 50% uh, than, uh, than the original vessel lumen. Also, we can have a cavernous uh, transformation known as uh, cavernoma uh, with uh, gross portal uh, portal collaterals uh, without uh, the original portal vein uh, seam. Uh, taking in consideration the interval change, we can have progressive, st stable, and regressive uh, portal vein uh, thrombosis. So what uh, do we do when uh, portal vein uh, thrombosis is, uh, is um, uh, suspected? Uh, the first thing uh, we can do is uh, abdominal uh, abdominal ultrasound, which is considered to be the first line imaging method uh, that can be used. It has an accuracy between 88% and 98% for the detection of portal vein thrombosis with a sensitivity and specificity of uh, above 80%. So how, how does, does it look? How uh, portal vein thrombosis uh, look? Uh, in grayscale uh, ultrasound, the thrombus appears to be hypo or isoechoic material, uh, which occupies a part of the lumen or uh, the entire lumen of the, the portal vein as uh, seen here in this capture. Also, when we have portal vein thrombosis, the portal vein uh, can be uh, enlarged. Here in this, uh, this video, we, we also can see uh, material in the, the lumen of the portal vein, an isoechoic aspect of uh, this uh, material, which probably is a, a complete uh, portal vein thrombosis because we don't see any lumen uh, left. The sensitivity of grayscale ultrasound in the di diagnosis of portal vein thrombosis can be improved by the use of Doppler ultrasound. Therefore, when the Doppler ultrasound is available, we, we should, uh, should uh, use it because uh, it can confirm whether the vessel has a remaining blood flow. So it helps us uh, to know if we are looking at a partial uh, thrombosis or to a complete thrombosis. Also, uh, Doppler ultrasound uh, help us characterize uh, the cavernoma, which I, uh, uh, I, uh, I talked about before. 
that uh, develops in uh, in um, in um, chronic portal vein thrombosis and uh, looks like multiple tortoise vessels seen uh, seen here in the 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 image. A more challenging situation is the diagnosis of portal vein thrombosis in, uh, in patients with uh, hepatic malignancy, especially in patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, these patients uh, can develop uh, a bland thrombosis as a consequence of severe cirrhosis and uh, of paraneoplastic thrombophilia, but also the tumor invasion of the portal vein is possible and uh, actually it's, uh, it's frequent. So it's, uh, it's very important uh, in every new diagnosis of portal vein thrombosis, uh, in particular in patients with a history of uh, malignancy of, uh, or, uh, of uh, a hepatocellular carcinoma or other malignancy, we need to, to rule out the, the, the malignant uh, portal vein thrombosis. So what, what do we see in the standard ultrasound? Uh, we see an, an expansive aspect of the mass inside the lumen. Also, uh, the, the, the aspect is heterogeneous. And uh, as you see here, we can see a disruption of the portal uh, vein walls. Uh, we can add uh, more value to the standard ultrasound by using Doppler uh, ultrasound. And uh, using Doppler ultrasound can help us uh, see signs of arterial uh, neovascularization. Uh, but for differentiating uh, 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 malignant uh, thrombosis uh, from uh, benign thrombosis, uh, the sensitivity and specificity of these techniques are not good enough. So what can we do? We can perform contrast-enhanced ultrasound and we can perform it immediately and we should perform it immediately after grayscale ultrasound in the same session because uh, it has a small additional cost uh, without any irradiation and uh, with almost no risk of complications. So how, how does it look on, uh, on, on CHELS? When we have a bland thrombosis, a benign one, uh, uh, this thrombosis is avascular. It has no vascularization. So it will not enhance during uh, serious examination, as we, as we can see, see here. This aspect is uh, it's, it's best visualized in the portal phase. On the other hand, when we have a malignant invasion of the portal vein, so a malignant thrombus, uh, we, we have the, the same enhancement pattern as the tumor from which it originated. We can observe here a, a, a rapid arterial phase uh, hyperenhancement and uh, a weak portal venous washout. In another uh, uh, CS, uh, image, we can, uh, we can observe also a hyper enhancement in the arterial phase after 12 seconds from the injection of uh, the contrast uh, substance and the washout uh, in the portal phase at, at uh, one minute. Uh, as, uh, as we can see in uh, these images, there is a big difference between the aspects seen on, uh, on uh, uh, cell, uh, serious. So the question is how useful is uh, CIRS in differentiating malignant thrombosis from uh, benign thrombosis? Uh, looking at the literature, uh, a review published by Danila et al, which aimed to evaluate the performance of uh, CIRS in characterization of portal vein uh, thrombosis, analyzed uh, seven studies. And uh, in all studies, uh, uh, CIRS uh, showed very good sensitivity and specificity for the diagnostic of malignant portal vein thrombosis. Therefore, the review concluded that CIRS can be used as the first line imaging method uh, for the characterization of portal vein thrombosis. In another study, a meta-analysis published in 2020 by Chen et al, aim to evaluate the diagnostic value of CIRS 
in differentiating between portal vein thrombosis and tumor in vein in hepatocellular carcinoma patients. After screening 986 uh, articles, uh, seven studies, including uh, 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 425 uh, participants, were analyzed. The pooled sensitivity and the specificity of CEOs in diagnostic uh, malignant thrombosis was uh, 0 0.94, and uh, the specificity was 0 0.99. Also, the pool OROC was 0 0.97. So the meta-analysis uh, concluded that the CUS is a highly efficient uh, method for differentiating malignant from uh, benign uh, portal vein thrombosis and can be used as an uh, alternative for CT and uh, or MRI. Also, uh, the latest uh, EPSOM guideline uh, published in, uh, in 2020 um, states that uh, CEOs is recommended uh, to differentiate between benign and malignant portal uh, vein thrombosis. But uh, we must bear in mind that ultrasound is an operator dependent method influenced by the examiner's experience and by the patient's condition. And sometimes we have an uh, inappropriate acoustic window due to the obesity or, uh, for example, bowel gas. Um, moreover, uh, using uh, ultrasound is quite uh, hard to assess bowel ischemia and uh, in acute portal vein thrombosis. Therefore, when we encounter this kind of problems, we should always use a second line cross-sectional uh, imaging methods such as uh, CT or um, MRI. In conclusion, I, I want to point out that uh, B-mode ultrasound is the first line imaging method uh, to be used when uh, portal vein thrombosis is suspected. And the uh, contrast uh, enhanced ultrasound proved to be a sensitive method for the characterization and also for the detection of portal vein thrombosis and is recommended uh, by uh, the guidelines to differentiate between benign and malignant portal vein thrombosis. Thank you and hope you, uh, we see each other uh, again in Timisoara in May. Thank you very much. Please stop your presentation. Then we can see each other. Thank you very much. And Alina, my fun, fantastic uh, pictures and data about the portal vein thrombosis. And that is the other system. At first, we started to uh, learn something about the big retroperitoneal vessels, aorta, and Kava, and now the next step is the portal vein system. Uh, my proposal is that we discuss it together because my part is also about the portal vein system, also about port signs of portal hypertension and portal vein thrombosis. And then we can we can discuss it at the end. Are there some questions? Yes, there is only one question, but I think we can we can answer it now because we can. I have I need some time to okay. uh, for so sharing, and you can. I can ask the question. Yes. The question is how invasive is uh, contrast intense ultrasound? Would you answer, Alex, or would you like me to answer? Yes. Yes. Uh, actually, it's uh, it's not uh, invasive at uh, all. Uh, we 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 inject a contrast uh, agent, uh, and the contrast agent is uh, it's uh, it's made from gas bubbles. So it's it's not uh, it doesn't inter interact with the 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 renal clearance or hepatic clearance. It's uh, perfectly safe, and uh, we don't have a major contraindication, and uh, we don't know any any important complication of uh, injecting a contrast enhanced substance. If you want to add something, uh, professor. No, I just wanted to tell uh, that uh, it's uh, five minutes more, <laughs> or sometimes less than five minutes. So the contrast study. Uh, usually it's around two or three minutes, so it's very 
um, avail the, it's a availability is extremely high as compared to uh, sectional imaging uh, where it's more difficult uh, to have the study uh, you need the program uh, the contrast uh, it has to go through uh, the kidney so it's more complicated this is why uh, we use it uh, a lot in uh, in practice uh, I think the next question uh, Julia we are going to wait to answer it after the presentation of Professor Nuremberg because he's going to address uh, this uh, similar topic uh, and uh, after uh, we are going uh, to answer all the questions that uh, are going uh, to remain there. So please feel free to ask uh, everything that you like to know. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Nuremberg and uh, please present us more interesting things about uh, the portal system. Please, oh, you. everybody, uh, you have to, uh, yes, uh, uh, stop the microphones. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, it's also recorded for, for the BIFIM website. Thank you. And I think it's a good idea to discuss also about contrast media ultrasound. But, but Alina, that could be a topic for one of our next webinars because we, we need a little bit more time for that. And on the other side, not everywhere uh, contrast media ultrasound is available. That it's a problem in the moment, yes. And But in Europe, we have a lot of experience now for more than 10 years. And also the thrombosis and the differentiation of the thrombosis, that is one indication in gastroenterology for contrast media ultrasound. We, we want to stay at the topic portal vein system. Yes, we discussed about cover vein and, uh, and aortic system. And now we want to discuss about the topic, uh, the portal veins. Sorry, that's next. Yes, uh, I like to sp speak a little bit about the anatomy and causes for portal hypertension, signs of portal hypertension. Is it necessary to measure or not? I like to show you some examples and also examples of uh, the portal vein thrombosis. Uh, we can find portal vein. Uh, we can find portal hypertension also. Uh, after portal vein thrombosis. It's necessary to make a monitoring and a summary at the end. And I learned in this book, that was my book, to learn something during my study, that's more than 40 years ago, about the embryology of the vessels and in, in the liver. And I learned that there are is a change that uh, the ductus venosus is closed then and the portal vein and the umbilical vein is also closed and sometimes we can find then in portal hypertension and reopening of some other vessels is it the umbilical vein or is it another one we want to speak about that we also know from the histology that in the liver everywhere in the liver the portal wean system, the bile duct system and uh, uh, the hepatic artery system, they are going together. They are going together at the glisson trias and they are in, you can find them between the hepatic cells and also in the hilum of the liver. And we look with this, you learned something by Leandro, how to use the probe. And if we use that probe from the shoulder to the umbilicus, that's a typical uh, section to show us uh, the portal wean. The portal wean, the diameter is nearly 11 to 15 millimeters and the long distance is nearly 10 to 15 centimeters. It's starting in the pancreatic head and the end is in the liver hilum. We use that uh, situation. Sometimes it's better to move, to turn the patient to the left side and with the right arm over his head. 
and we have a typical mark uh, the the portarine that is a guideline for us also for the common viaduct ventral of the portarine we can find the common viaduct that's why it's also very interesting for us to look in the ligamentum uh, hepato duodenale. That is a structure where we can find the portarine, the hepatic artery, the right branch, and the common bile duct. And here you can see that is a carbovene, very dorsal. That is the portarine, and that small one here is a part of the common bile duct. It's a little bit longer here, and you can see the cross here between them. That is uh, the hepatic artery. We can see two branches here, and that is the portal vein. If you follow or if you come from there, that is the splenic vein. It goes in, in the confluence. It goes together with the mesenteric vein. And then here, that is the start of the portal vein into the hilum of the liver. It's a junction of vena mesenterica superior and vena lienalis. The splenic vein and the mesenteric vein, they go together in the confluence. And you remember that we look for the confluence also if we look into the pancreas, the hepatic, uh, the splenic vein that is our guideline also for the examination of the pancreas. That also we look in the uh, hilum of the liver in the left and right branch of the portal vein and I told you already that the diameter is a little bit more than 10 millimeters to 15 16 millimeters the portal vein is our guideline for the hepatic uh, for the uh, common bile duct and we look there also if we look for portal hypertension that are very nice pictures of Frank Henry uh, Netter. Frank Henry Netter, he was really, he was a doctor, American doctor, but he was really also an artist. He was an art and very famous painter of anatomy and everyone knows his pictures and we use it. And I think the pictures here of the portal vein system are very beautiful. The blood is coming from the spleen, yes, uh, in through the splenic vein and goes to the confluence. It goes together with the blood from the mesenteric uh, vein, and then that is the start, the confluence, the start of the portal vein. And it goes in the right branch and in the left branch here in the hilum of the liver. The mesenteric inferior very seldom we uh, see it direct we see we can see the superior uh, mesenteric superior we have some uh, variants here you can see it uh, there where the inferior is going in the splenic vein or it's going direct in the mesenteric superior or others and i like very much the pictures of Frank Netter, and then I remember what is the real anatomy there. Very often we see the situation of portal hypertension in liver cirrhosis with a typical sign of ascites, of a big spleen, and of collateral. So you can see here the uh, cirrhosis of the liver. On the other side, another cause of uh, the portal hypertension and we heard a lot about that uh, is the thrombosis of the portal vein system that is a view under the ribs into the hilum and you can see that the lumen of the portal vein is echo rich we have echogenic material in the left branch of the portal vein and the right branch and that is the main part of the portalween here, that is the common bile duct, the hepatic artery. Echogenic material inside of the portalween, that is an thrombosis. The differentiation of the thrombosis, it's a little bit more uh, difficult. We discussed already about that. And remember what you learned in your study and uh, about the uh, causes and the types of portal hypertension. We have 
a prehepatic type of obstruction, intrahepatic obstruction, and posthepatic uh, causes of portal hypertension. And uh, that is very important. You can learn about that if you look in ultrasound imagine the European journal and also we have seen already some papers from Berzigotti and Berzigotti and others from Bologna. They also published about the portal hypertension in our journal. And a very important sign for us is a diameter of the splenic vein in inspiration and expiration and also of the mesenteric vein. If we have a diameter, no compression of the vein and uh, we have a diameter of one centimeter, then it's really a sign of more pressure in the portal vein system. The other signs that we say there's no respiratory difference of the diameter of the splenic vein. Other signs are collaterals, splenomegaly is already a further sign and we have a change of the blood flow in the main uh, branch of the in, the in the main portal vein and we have some ascites here is an example of a dilatation of the splenic vein you can see it here also a little bit better in the color doppler and that is the situation, no compression, higher pressure in the vena mesenteric superior and the mesenteric vein here. And that is a very typical and specific uh, sign for portal hypertension. Another sign is that uh, the blood flow is going, is changing. And that means if we look in the portal vein, in the main portal vein, then you normally we have the the blood is uh, going from the splenic vein, the mesenteric vein into the liver. That is uh, hepatopetal flow, like in this picture here, it's red. But if it is going, it's it's the color is blue and the blood is going out of the liver. Then we have a change of the flow of the blood flow in the portal vein. And that means we have uh, portal hypertension. There are some authors who measured uh, the velocity, the mean velocity in normal persons and in cirrhosis. And there's really a difference. The normal velocity is nearly 15 centimeters per second. And in cirrhosis, in progressive cirrhosis, we have only the half of the velocity uh, in like in, in, in normal patients. But in the uh, practice, I very seldom use the measurement. More often we look for the splenic vein and the mesenteric vein. If we have an hepatofugal flow, I told you that that means that the blood is going out of the liver. It's going in the wrong direction because the supply of the, the, the nutrition of the liver is, is done by the artery, uh, by the uh, hepatic artery. And the maximal velocity is going down and we can also find collaterals there. And just last week, I have seen this patient here. And that is the typical, that is a longitudinal section in the middle abdominal abdomen. And we see a lot of vessels of black vessels and that are unnormal vessels. And then we use the color Doppler and we can see that that are really vessels and we have an, an uh, color inferno we say that we have a lot of color between the normal structures of the upper abdomen and that means that are portosystemic collaterals that is a very typical science of collaterals
And other, we have a lot of uh, possibilities for collaterals like this one. You can see here, these collaterals inside of the abdominal wall, they are going from the liver, that's a longitudinal section. And here, that is the region of the umbilicus, and there we have more vessels than in the upper part. That is also a vessel what is coming from the liver hilum. It's going through the ligamentum teres. It's going in the direction of the probe, and then uh, it's going from the probe to the umbilicus inside of the abdominal wall, and that is a recanalization of the umbilical vein and it's going into a caput meduse and convolute from collaterals inside of the abdomen. You can see here in the systematic that the collaterals, the portosystemic big shans, most often we can find paraumbilical veins that are not really recanalizated umbilical veins that are vasa vasorum of the umbilical vein that are small paraumbilical veins and because of the pressure of uh, the portal vein system they are bigger and bigger and we can find them in the ligamentum teres now as uh, Cruvalier von Baumgarten syndrome the two men they described at first time on the other side, we have other shunts. I like to show you, they are more seldom, but I like to show you some of that shunts that you can see. If you meet that, uh, you have, for instance, that. That was a big vessel, acupure vessels, on the lower part of the spleen. That is the spleen. It's not very large, a little bit more large. And here is the kidney. And around the kidney and to from the spleen, to the kidney, in, it's going into the renal vein. That is an portosystemic shunt, the uh, renal splenic shunt. That is also a typical one. Another shunt you can see here that is the hilum of the spleen. We have a lot of collaterals here, also here. You can see here in the color Doppler that it was a stomach and inside of the abdominal wall we have the the uh, the uh, Cruvalier from Baumgarten syndrome with uh, recanalization and caput meduse the internal caput meduse but look again to the spleen we have from the large enlarged splenic vein we have collaterals going to the wall of the stomach and that are uh, gastrite brevis that are other collaterals and they cause then the uh, fun fundus varices. I told you that through from the hilum of the liver through the ligamentum teres we can often see a vessel that's a recanalizated para umbilical vein or a canalizated and dilated para umbilical vein. We can follow the vein inside of the abdominal wall here. That is a typical Cuvalier from Baumgarten syndrome. Very seldom, if you look in an ascites uh, patient to the wall of uh, the gallbladder, you can see some structures uh, inside of the gallbladder, like here, and some uh some vessels inside you can look here and that are also gallbladder wall varices you can that is also one other possibility it, uh, for collaterals it was a patient a man 68 years old with an hcc and portal system hypertension we come to the next i showed you already the pictures here with the collaterals inside of the abdomen. And then I look to the splenic vein, and you can see here that a part of the splenic vein is enlarged, and we have thrombotic material in the splenic vein, like here. And it's not a complete 
thrombosis, but it's an old thrombosis and sign of the old thrombosis of the splenic vein in that situation of pancreatitis, of chronic pancreatitis, are that calcifications here. Are calcification and echo-rich thrombosis, that are signs that the thrombosis is more than six months old. We say it's an old to the next, please. I don't know where. That is the next to an old thrombosis. And that is the liver, the left branch. We can't see the portal vein inside the liver. It's filled with echo rich material also in the next here. That here you have to look for the portal vein, but, but there is echo rich material. If the thrombosis is older, the material is echo rich and that is different to other situation of fresh thrombosis. What are the uh, causes of portal vein thrombosis? You uh, have seen already that paper of uh, Sharin and others. Also, uh, most often cirrhosis and liver tumors like HTC. I re remember that uh, if you see a central portal vein thrombosis, you have every time you have to think about an HTC. If you see a thrombosis of the vena of the splenic vein, you have to think about and pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis. That is important. You can see here, that is a thrombosis. It's a little bit more echo rich that is inside the liver. We come back to the main portal vein that is a confluence. Here the other one too, and two more HCC and metastasis in that situation in HCC. We used in that situation, sorry, we used contrast media and that is a portal vein and you can see that we have an enhancement of the portal vein inside and that may, means we have vascularization bubbles inside of the uh, thrombosis and that means it's a malignant thrombosis in HCC. So we can show that. That is an example of a um, very fresh uh, thrombosis. In the color Doppler, the, the portal vein is echo pure. We have no signal, but it's very echo pure. Also here, it's echo pure, the confluence and the vena uh, lianalis. We have a splenomegaly. We have also some collaterals in that situation and with color doppel with contrast media we could show that it is in thrombosis also that is a fresh thrombosis like this too in fresh thrombosis are echo pure and uh, sometimes they are changing their image echo pure fresh thrombosis no signal no malignant thrombosis here in, in contrast media ultrasound. That is important. And in old thrombosis, in tumor thrombosis, you have signal in contrast media ultrasound. You have also seen some picture of the late form of a thrombosis, and that is the carbonoma, the changing, like here, that is in um, color inferno in the hilum of the liver. That is the cover normal. Not uh, every time in situation of thrombosis, sometimes also a thrombosis following. Here is the cover noma in black and white ultrasound. And here you can see it in color Doppler ultrasound, also in contrast media. It's very good visible. We come to the no, come to the end. And that was our small program for that time, our conclusion. The signs of portal hypertension, the best signs are collaterals, changing of the blood flow direction in the portal vein, and the non-compression vena, splenic vein, and mesenteric vein in, in expiration. 
the cover, uh, the thrombosis of uh, the uh, very good visible, not that it's a mistake here, the portal vein thrombosis, and you can differentiate the portal vein thrombosis in pancreatitis and in HCC. You can differentiate if you use contrast media ultrasound in, in another webinar we want to show you more. If you have some question, and if you find such the uh, artificial vessels in the body, then it's my sign, the ad sign, and you can write me or other people who know what it is, and you have to think about portal vein system collaterals. Thank you very much, and now we can answer your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Nuremberg, and yes, we have questions. Uh, the one that was uh, previously put, but uh, we said that we are going to answer after your presentation. The question from Julia, can we distinguish a recent portal vein thrombosis? I mean, if uh, the thrombosis is not hyperechoic, can we diagnose it with Doppler or contrast intense ultrasound? The age we have in contrast in Doppler or contrast enhanced ultrasound, we have no signs for the uh, how old is the thrombosis. I think the the echo texture, the structure, give us more signs. If it is more echo rich, it's older. If we have calcification occasions, it's very old. Uh, but if we have a vascularization inside of the thrombosis, then it's a sign that it's a tumor grow into the vessels. The next question is, could the decreased hepatic flow velocity explain, uh, explained by uh, mesenteric vein thrombosis or, or splenic thrombosis and not due to liver cirrhosis? The decreased flow uh, hepatic flow uh, to be explained by the thrombosis of the mesenteric vein or the splenic vein thrombosis? I think uh, if, if you have a lower flow in the portal vein, you have to make an examination of the whole system. You have to look also for the other uh, vessels uh, what, what are going in the portal vein. And uh, I have at, at first, if you, we have an obstruction that is, and then we have to think about, about the portal hypertension. And the next step is that we look what is the cause of the portal hypertension. Is it inside of the liver or is it outside? Is it an thrombosis? And sometimes the thrombosis is the first reason for the portal hypertension. But we have heard already that often the thrombosis in cirrhosis is following the hepatic obstruction of the flow. Perhaps, Leandro, what is your experience? Or Alina, what do you think? Portal, portal uh, hypertension is very common in Latin America and portal thrombosis also. Most of the portal thrombosis that we we we, uh, we uh, usually see correspond to co correspond to um, malignant condition. For example, we have lymphoproliferative syndromes, uh, and of course, as you mentioned, uh, HCC. Uh, we do uh, the uh, the total examination of with with B mode and, and, and Doppler. Uh, and uh, we used the mean velocity normally, not the peak velocity or maximum velocity. We, we prefer to use the mean velocity. Uh, and we have another, another tools, for example, the congestive index uh, using the area of the porta, the area of the porta and the, and the mean velocity is quite useful for us. Uh, and we have very, we see with a lot of frequency, and it's a pity, uh, cavernomas in children, because in our in our countries, uh, when the, the newborn has some problem with uh, compatibility, RH compatibility, they make a catheterization of the umbilical of the umbilical vein, 
uh, and uh, it produced some damage inside the portal. And then we unfortunately see these small patients, very young patients, five years, seven years old, with a severe portal hypertension because of the medical procedure. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. I think that is that's very important. Uh, nearly 20 years ago, it was also the, the situation in Germany, but and in Europe, but they go to other uh, application of the uh, different application of the catheter now, and because the rate of uh, the umbilical vein thrombosis is really mm -hmm. too high. Yes, mm -hmm. that's true. But sometimes we have. A spontaneous thrombosis in uh, young uh, young ladies with uh, who, who take contraception to make contraceptions. Yes, and then they sometimes they come with with uh, bleeding of esophagus varices and they have no cirrhosis and they have no pancreatitis, but we see then the portal hypertension and sometimes also in carbonoma. And that is only the only reason is contraception, oral contraception. Okay, I, other I, questions I, from the presentation of Please Alexandru. write if you have any other questions. I just wanted to, to add regarding uh, liver cirrhosis that we have to keep in mind that uh, liver cirrhosis, it's a disease uh, where uh, co uh, hypercoagulability is quite frequent. So. Okay. This is uh, one of the problems why these patients can have uh, thrombosis. It's not uh, mainly regarding the velocity of the flow. It's mainly regarding uh, the changes that are due uh, to the disease in uh, the coagulability of, uh, of the blood. Any other questions? I think nobody wrote think, anything else. I think the, 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 the thrombosis, the uh, splenic vein thrombosis uh, in pancreatitis and in uh, the, the mesenteric vein thrombosis in pancreatitis, they are a little bit different. They are uh, very often reversible. And, and sometimes we, we find the veins are already often after some weeks, and we can also see some collaterals. The collaterals come very fast, but uh, also the vessels are often again. Sometimes we see only a, a partial uh, old thrombosis, but not a full thrombosis. They are really different to the complete thrombosis in cirrhosis or in HCC. Okay, are there other questions? Then we come to, we are in time, it's uh, our last part now. We come to the Mentimeter. You can see here my iPhone, and I will share you the David and Niels, they prepared, and uh, you, will, uh, you will see that some of the clips we asked you, what is it? And we give you the questions you have seen already. That's why I, uh, you have seen in the in the chat uh, the link for the Mentimeter, and on the other side, I like to share now the QR scan. Uh, I already shared it in the. Uh, okay, for me also. it's for me it's more easy to to scan. Yes. And then, okay, you have seen the QR code. That is the same, you can go in the link. That's also, then I can stop again. And now you can, or I have to change the host. You can start, yes? Yep. Okay, go on. Okay, perfect. So I will also share the presentation. So one more moment, please. So, I think now you should uh, also see our 
uh, Mentimeter screen. So and you also have uh, the code here in front of the um, or on top of the uh, page. You can also join it when you go on menti.com or you have uh, the other option via the link uh, in the chat. There you can also uh, connect with each uh, with us here. Yeah, so we also welcome you to our Epsom Students webinar, the first one of 2022 about the vessels. And uh, the first part is um, to pin on this image uh, where you're from. So we are uh, very excited uh, where you're also living here. And you can also pin directly on your phone or on a screen. So we have two people from Germany right now. Oh, up to East Asia, that's, that's good. The time is okay. It's in the evening, but it's still viable to be in this lecture. We wait for some more. We have nine, Ooh. ten participants now. Someone from Jamaica or Cuba, <laughs> Central America. It's about nine o'clock in, in the at the East Coast in the North America, so they are also able to join. Okay, we have we can see now thirteen people. Some okay, more. perfect. We are fifty-two, so maybe <laughs> we will yeah, some bit. more of you. <laughs> yes. Please. Take part in the, in the that is the evaluation what you learned. Yes, <laughs> I and can tell so you that, that I have the app, and when on the app, it's when you start it, you just put the code and you are there, or we use the QR code. I can tell you that at the beginning it was not so easy for me also, but <laughs> okay, some more. Okay, perfect. So we can... Okay, we start now. Exactly. So we have our first image. So you see here an aorta. And this I is think also... you, have, you have seen that image. It is a transversal section. Okay, so and the first is an open uh, question, so you can also uh, type your answer directly on your phone. And the, our question is, what could you see in the picture? So you have uh, one opinion, and you can see, or you can write on your phone, what do you think what the pathology is here? So we have an aneurysm, a partially thrombosed aorta. So most of you are going with an aortic aneurysm. Yeah, we also have a dissection here. Okay, so we will also have a look on the picture and maybe you can also uh, say something about it. I think it's from Leonardo. Please. Leona, Leandro, you can give a short comment. Yes, yes, we are seeing here and uh... Uh, a triple A abdominal aorta aneurysm in transversal. Uh, it's a it's a image uh, that shows us also plates uh, in the posterior wall. Uh, the aorta is dilated, and we can observe um, parietal thrombus, also thrombosis. Okay. Okay, perfect. So we go on to the next loop. Uh, uh, excuse, uh, on my screen, yeah. on my screen is a red sign, a red uh, V. Can you explain? Yeah. 
I will have a look here. So I think I have to start it again. I'm using the meantime, take some time to load the videos uh, for, from the servers of Mentimeter. So please uh, write in the chat if, it, if we are proceeding too fast with the videos. I think it's just not on the presentation, so... Where is it? <laughs> I think it's Was directly it? on the screen here. Yes, <laughs> if you click on view options and choose annotate, and then you can delete it. It's someone who annotate on the screen. Ah. So by clicking on view options, up, and then choose please annotate. Ah, and then you have a I found the rubber. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. Also. <laughs> yeah, perfect. that's Thank perfect. You. Then we continue. <laughs> okay. Okay, perfect. So we're going to the next one. Okay, I will proceed from here. The the little look at the what is file in, in English? Arrow. The arrow, thank you. Like <laughs> it's not one hundred percent because I'm not that capable in in video production. That is anatomy. That is an anatomy question. The vessels are the guidelines for us. A question for all of you, please answer in the chat. Can everybody see this video or does it take a little bit more time to load the video for you? For me, it's perfect. Me okay. also. All right. Okay. I am okay. Okay, now we come to the question. Now we come, which vessel passes between AMS and AO? Okay, vote. Faster you answer, the more points you get. Three, two, one. Okay. Yep. Most of them are right. Most of them are right. Five of nine. Please try to uh, participate. We have 11 participants who would like to take you all to take, participate in the session. I'd like to give a short comment. Yes, it was my, my clip. Between the aorta and between arteria mesenterica superior is going the left uh, renal vein. Okay. To the next. The next clip, a longitudinal cut. It's also an anatomic question. There's a large vessel in the background, and two vessels comes from that large retroperitoneal vessel. And we ask now for the lower one. Which will it go for from the aorta? Three, two, one, 14 people, 15. Both is right. That is okay. <laughs> also, the the lower one is the mesenteric artery. Yes, this one, and the upper one that is the celiac trunk. Because you asked what is going ventral, both are going ventral. Then both of the answers are right. I think. 
Okay, now it's a little bit more difficult. We have a transversal section of the abdomen similar to the first clip and now we change to the longitudinal section we also use the color doppler and now the question the large echo deficit mass is Perfect. Most of you are right. That's good. And partial thrombotic abdominal aortic aneurysm. It's you can see the the free lumen and the thrombotic lumen and the diameter. We have no centimeter on the. Uh, on the side, but it's more than five centimeters. You have seen when it is more than six centimeter, you have to go to the surgeon. Remember the lecture of Leandro. We go to the next now. Transversal section. Echo rich material in a big retroperitoneal vessel. You can follow a little bit to another one. And now we change to the longitudinal section and also use the color Doppler. No, no Doppler inside of the vessel, but it's going around. Question four, the thrombosis of the cover vein occurs more frequently in. What are the most often causes? Okay, I think <laughs> number three is right. Renal cell carcinomas, you have seen also the left, that is a tumor thrombus of, and in the first picture we have seen, that is, it comes from the re left renal vein, the thrombosis, and goes in the main cava vein here. And you must know that most often the reason of a cava vein thrombosis that are the renal cell cancers sometimes also some other reasons but most often in my opinion are the renal cell cancer remember this picture You can see the pictogram. The pictogram is right. That is a vessel inside of the abdominal wall. And now the question. Which vessel draws from the liver towards the navel or umbilicus? Remember. It was a syndrome. Yes, everyone, nearly everyone is right. Perfect. That is the para umbilical vein. It's going 
on the right side there is the near of the umbilicus and sometimes you have there you can find there convolute of vessels the caput medusae internus next one please so we have our first leaderboard here and for now with the most points are clippy and then brand the broken So it's round right about 100 points between them. So okay. we will also have some pictures here. Remember this clip. You can see the ascites here. We have no vessels inside that big central vessel in the liver. Okay, I think it's, yes, we, we discussed about the differentiation of old and fresh portal vein thrombosis. Most of you are right, this portal vein thrombosis, no signal in the portal vein. And uh, if it is very echo pure, then it's more, uh, then it's in fresh uh, thrombosis. If it is echo rich, then it's more an old one. I think I, it needs a little bit more time to have a better frequency here. Yeah, that's not so sharp, but you can see a lot of colored vessels in the hilum of the liver. What does it mean? And we come to the question. A little bit ascites, was it? Yes. What pathology can be seen? Most often are right. That is a typical cavernoma. Yes, if you have the color, a lot of color inside of the whole liver, then you have to think about an Osler syndrome. Yes, that are aner small aneurysmata. Okay, that is an inferno, we say, colored inferno. We stay at the liver and look from the ribs, under the ribs, into the hilum. A little bit ascites. Some of you can see also a tumor in the liver with an echo rich filled big vessel central of the liver. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's a portal wean, and we spoke about portal wean. That's why the butchiari is a thrombosis of the vein system, of the hepatic vein system. And in butchiari, you can't see the hepatic veins. And this, in our situation here, uh, we have an echo rich thrombosis of the hilum of the portal vein, the left branch, and 
the, also in the right branch. And on the right side, you can see a tumor mass. And that's the typical sign of the tumor thrombosis in the, the portal vein. Thanks. So we have the uh, leaderboard right now. Okay. And we have the same, nearly the same picture here. So on the first is Clippy, and on the second also, very directly behind it is Brand the Broken. So I think we will also have one or two other um, pictures here, and then we can also see how is our winner today. Okay. This picture you have also seen a big vessel between spleen and left kidney. It's going around the kidney. Yes, it's not a normal one. It's a connection between two systems. Okay, that's perfect. Yes, yeah, sometimes it's, it's it's unnormal. It's an variant, but it's a typical uh, connect in portal hypertension. You can find here the spin splenorenal shunts. Okay. So we are going. Oh, yeah, the sorry? last one. Yes. Now. Exactly. It's the last one. We haven't seen it in our lecture. We haven't spoke about that. That's transversal section. Here in the middle, that is not a vessel. That's a, perhaps it's a duct without blood. And an acupure lesion in front. It's in the upper abdomen. It's a transversal section, yes. Okay, we didn't spoke about that. It's a pseudoaneurysm. Yes, it's a thrombotic aneurysm of an in, in the time before it was an pseudocyst and a vessel is uh, destroyed the ball and makes it to an pseudoaneurysm, a typical structure in pancreatic, chronic pancreatic diseases, pseudoaneurysma of arteria leonalis in that situation. And the duct, what you can see there, that is a pancreatic duct with calcifications in the patient with chronic pancreatitis. And, uh, that is another situation of vessel diseases in the abdomen, complications in gastrointestinal uh, diseases. So we will have a look, last look at the leaderboard. So, and our winner today is in the last way, it's TH. Oh, TH. <laughs> Who is TH? <laughs> yeah, yeah, from Witten, University of Witten. Ah, <laughs> Tino Hoffmann from Witten. I mean, we know him already. He is the winner. I'm very happy this Clippy is not the winner because I'm Clippy. Yes. <laughs> I made it. And, and not Gregor as always. <laughs> yes, Gregor was the other time. Gregor was the winner every time. Okay, thank you, uh, David and Niels, for the preparation and the fantastic quiz.
And Alina, please, please you have yes. the last word. Thank you. I hope everybody enjoyed uh, uh, the Mentimeter. I think it's very interesting and uh, I really hope, I think we have to uh, present more detailed how it, wor it works because then maybe more of our participants will join us. <laughs> So um, thank you everybody for being today with us and uh, thank you the speakers, Professor Leandro Fernandez, it was very nice to see you and uh, very nice to hear you, Professor Nuremberg the same. Alex, thank you for your contribution uh, to the webinar. Uh, the next meeting is going to be, uh, the next uh, students webinar is going to be on the 5th of uh, March. So it's also Saturday, at, uh, also at noon for the European and um, depending on where you are it's going to be a different time and the topic is going to be gastrointestinal ultrasound. Uh, before we finish maybe uh, if I just can share uh, with you some other information. Uh, the next uh, webinar actually that you can also join uh, from uh, Vufumb is uh, the vascular webinar that is going uh, to be on the 16th of uh, February. You have all the information regarding uh, this on uh, the Vufumb uh, website. So go there for a lot of information. You can also uh, ac uh, uh, access uh, the FSUMB um, website for other uh, interesting uh, uh, information about uh, webinars, uh, Eurozon schools. And uh, of course, I hope you can see uh, the picture. So yes. next year, uh, next um, in, the f in a few months <laughs> in May, uh, we are waiting for you. Uh, in Timisoara, where we are going to have the Wufum Epson Student Ultrasound Congress in the 27 uh, to 28th of May, together with uh, the World Congress of Ultrasound. It's in conjunction also to the Eurozone meeting and our national meeting. So we are all waiting for all of you. And um, of course, we would really uh, like you to benefit from all uh, the offers that uh, Bufumb and Epsom have to, uh, to give you and to share with you. Professor Nuremberg. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to work together with you, Leandro. Have a nice time and a successful webinar in two weeks. All the other, we wish you the best and see you again in four weeks. Yes. And David and Niels, thank you yes. very much. Thank you, and David. Thank you. The Niels. same to Alexandru. See you. Thank you. Thanks. See you.